Welcome uh, to this Max Weber interview with Rosie Perlotti. My name is Gabrielle Bartling. I'm a Max Weber Fellow at the EOI, um, the law and law department. And uh, um, my colleague, uh, Richard Kretsch, uh, is also a Max Weber Fellow at the um, law department here at the EOI. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an incredible honor to have Professor Perlotti with us today. Professor Pradotti is a distinguished assistant professor emerita at Utrecht University, where she has taught since 1988 and where she was the founding professor of women's studies, as well as the founding director of the Center for the Humanities. Professor Pradotti is a continental philosopher and feminist theorist whose work is at the intersection of and draws on social and political theory, gender theory, as well as post-colonial studies. Her most recent work, her work on the posthuman condition or the posthuman convergence, is the forefront of current debates about the reconfiguration of human identity and subjectivity in light of technological and ecological transformations. She has developed these theories in uh, three monographs Posthuman, published in 2013, Posthuman Knowledge, published in 2019, and Posthuman Feminism, published in 2021. It's no exaggeration to say that her contributions have been truly transformative in the fields of continental philosophy and feminist theory. Um, so, Rosie, whether in your work on the theory or on uh, the post human convergence, your research has always been concerned with questions on identity, subjectivity, and the formation of counters, uh, subjectivities, and alternative, alternative subject groups. Can you explain uh, your move from the nomadic theory to posthuman theory and how they relate to each other? And also maybe reflect or, or explain to us how posthumanism relates to transhumanism. Thank you so much, and dear Gabriel Michel, for having me. Thank you to the Max Weber program of the Institute for Inviting me. Great honor to be back here. I spent many happy years at the Robert Schum uh, Institute as a Don um, Monet Fellow and Professor, so great to be back uh, and good luck to everybody with your wonderful work here. So, a simple question, million dollar question. Um, I am sort of um, myself quite astounded really by how um, a research career and the monographs that comes from research um, dialogue with each other. Um, it, it, the books go out into the world and they start talking to one another, it's independently of the author, it's quite extraordinary. I'm always humbled by the effect of um, publications. Um, they, you lose them the moment you put them out there. It's, it's, very, it's a big relief for those of you who are still terrified of anything that you write. Trust me, you will be dispossessed the moment you publish it. So just relax and get it done. Um, nomadism is part of the very early work to try to transform the humanist understanding of subjectivity. It's very much the work of um, a baby boomer generation working in the 1980s. I was in Paris studying with the philosophers that became the post structuralist generation uh, with Michel Foucault, with Lucie Ligure, with uh, Gilles Deleuze, um, but there were so many others, the Lyotard, the Len Sixou, uh, there were, there were uh, there was, um, I think, Michel Serre, the amazing people. And what they were trying to say is that you cannot really solve serious questions with the same language that you use to formulate them, which is Einstein's fundamental insight. You need to learn to think differently. Uh, so it's a non-reformist way to go about philosophy. And they did this because they took very seriously the role of philosophy in uh, history, modern history, European history, the role of philosophy in the Second World War and fascism, the role of philosophy in the in colonial experience, for them it was the Algerian war, and the role of philosophy in supporting systems of domination and oppression. They didn't do that in any negative sense of the term. It wasn't a cheap shot, um, uh, guilt tripping. It was calling philosophy to accountability for the ideas that it put out into the world. Uh, so, nomadism became a critique of the idea of unitary identities, fixed, steadily, rock hard identities um, that are encapsulated in a vision of the human uh, represented by man. Um, my teacher, Jeremy Lloyd, in 1984, published a one of the watershed books, Feminist Philosophy, called The Man of Reason. And The Man of Reason, the Enlightenment, the Child of the Enlightenment, is very much a man. 
um, and he is white, and he is um, uh, supposedly heterosexual, heterosexual, is European, and I represent him in the Vitruvian model of the Renaissance man. Um, to say this vision of the human is partial and culture specific, it is not universal, is not to fall into relativism. And, and I think the nomadic theory and argument is we are positioned and situated differently. It doesn't mean that anything goes, it doesn't mean that there is no truth and no values, but there is not one universal standard that can represent the human. We said that in the 1980s. Imagine that by now, 1980 was still the Cold War, was still a world divided, was still the hegemony of the American vision of the world. Um, it's still a Europe that hadn't come to terms with um, uh, what we did in the Second World War, what we had done in the colonies. It was very early days in terms of consciousness and of, of the limitations of the greatness of Europe. So nominalism begins always saying we need to think of ourselves as rooted but flowing, I'm quoting Virginia Woolf here, grounded but we take our roots with ourselves as we move. We are, as Europeans, um, very mobile subject. Our mobility has taken a multiplicity of forms, including significantly imperialism and colonialism, but not only. We are also masses of poor immigrants that went into the new world, uh, creating you know, almost unsurmountable clashes between millions of Italians and Irish landing in Australia, and the indigenous population of Australia being invaded by these whites but uh, Italian Jews and Irish are not as white as some other whites. So the, com the complications of the racialization of movement um, in the, against the myth of Odysseus, you know, the, the traveling European, the explorer driven by curiosity. We were driven by many other reasons other than curiosity, greed, and domination being some. All of this again in a, an affirmative mode, not want to be overcritical, but so I said we need to rethink ourselves as a multiple subject, multiple position, and have these differences uh, accountable for, uh, being able to express them and uh, bring them to accountability. So I started with feminist art production, uh, always in alliance with an intersectional approach, so um, uh, the race and ethnicity issue, very much the anti-fascist line, running through. Why? Because fascism is the myth of solid, steady, eternal identities. One, Italian, Catholic, <laughs> heterosexual, um, woman, wife, mother, um, quoting uh, various political figures of today. One, one, one. Um, and I think the dictatorship of one is something that feminism um, uh, takes on. From that idea of a subject that is multiple, but accountable and grounded, I started uh, applying my method, which is a cartographic method of tracking systems of knowledge production and how knowledge constructs subject positions. Um, what kind of knowledge does a nomadic subject contain? Well, one thing, Europeans are polylingual people. Uh, most of us speak several languages. That's not nothing, considering the illiteracy of the Anglo-American world when it comes to world languages. Monolingual people are very limited people. Uh, I actually don't even know many monolingual people. Uh, if I were a monolingual person, I would be very uncomfortable in the world today. Uh, multiplicity begins at home, it begins very early. So, starting mapping out forms of knowledge production, competences in the world in various situated practices, um, I started noticing uh, late 90s, really, mid to late 90s, more and more scholarship around the question of the human. Uh, Catherine Hales writes a book called How We Became Posthuman in 1999. Already in 1985, Donna Haraway says, we have become cyborg in a world-changing text called well, A Manifesto for Cyborg, but a significant subtitle, A Feminist Socialist Manifesto for the 20th Century. People forget the subtitle, the cyborg manifesto. So the idea that the technological takeover of the human was ongoing was in the air, early days of the virtual reality, uh, early days of, of the technological revolution. But the explosion of scholarship on the human, inhuman, posthuman, transhuman, was such that all of a sudden this jumped out for me. The cartographic method is a way of surveying the field and seeing what is happening around key notions. And, and I've always done philosophy as a 
as a sort of a kind of a survey and um, navigational tool hoping to put out their instruments that other people can also use to navigate the field and maybe come up with a different understanding of what is happening. But it was clearly that the question of the human was emerging, so I started looking at what was being produced. And this meant really stepping outside codified academic knowledge, because there was no course on transformation of the human other than in a historical perspective or an anthropological perspective. Um, yeah, institutes of technology would be doing the robotics, artificial intelligence, virtual reality as we called it then, early algorithmic studies, but without any is really overall um, philosophical or, or even critical framework. Um, and what struck me was the presence of a dominant understanding of the relationship between the human and the technological, which is transhumanism. And transhumanism is today um, taught and headquarters at the University of Oxford, among others, but I think I would say is the dominant ethos of cognitive capitalism, advanced capitalism, and it is um, the belief that the human as a model of cognition is rather old-fashioned, that both our organisms and our brains are less fast, less efficient in thinking and certainly computing than the computational network that we have designed ourselves. Artificial intelligence is faster, better. So is speed here the, the factor that we and I was struck by the kind of self-evident manner in which machine envy was being written into the social script. The human is an old model, the machines are better, the technology is more advanced, then we have to enhance the human, we have to improve the human. Transhumanism is the school of human enhancement. We have to accelerate the human brain, we have to accelerate our entire neurological system, we have to do it through implants, through various types of intervention, because we are slower than the technological network that we have created. And the program that they run in Oxford is called Super Intelligence, and it is a very prestigious academic program that, that preaches this type of um, ethos, which is then applied across society in the various technological applications that we get and in an overall feeling that is between the euphoria of oh, the technologies are so advanced and the melancholy but then we human are doomed and I think I was struck by this kind of manic depressive logic of, of excitement and despair that surrounds this whole operation of transhumanism so what I wanted to do is First of all, put this on the table and say to everybody, do you see this too? Is this really happening? Is, is a, a massive human enhancement program being run at Oxford? And did we have a conversation about, do we want to be enhanced? Uh, did anybody actually consult us on, or is it just obvious that we are an old model and consequently we need to be improved? Where was the conversation? Whatever happened to democracy here in terms of the human? But of course, the answer in transhumanism is very um, insidious, if I may say so, with all due respect, in that they say that analytically they accept that the human is not the center. So analytically, they are post anthropocentric and the machines are better, technology is faster. When it comes to values, however, they bring back the old humanism, saying it would be better for humanity if we enhance you to transmit microchip drugs, whatever, and we make you more efficient, because then you will function better in the name of humanist perfectibility of the human through science and technology. And at that point, I just started thinking of a critical human and posthumanist school where I bring back the nomadic stuff and says, but just a moment, you cannot couple the new technology with the old humanist subject because we get a despotic one vision of the human controlling a huge technological field that is capable of going in every possible direction. And we need to have a nomadic subject at the core of the posthuman enterprise, a heterogeneous, diversified, differential subject, not the old man coming back in uh, on his high technology going off to Mars which, by the way, is exactly what the other big transhumanist of today, Elon Musk, is doing right now. Taking the old vision of the human, putting it on a spaceship, launching a new generation of space exploration, which is a 
about the extractive economy and mining planets and, uh, in, in, the, in the outer space. So it's a bit, you think that I'm making this up, but honestly I couldn't even invent this if I tried. I stay close to reality, to what's happening in the world. I read the newspapers with great care and I try to connect the dots. So that's a bit the operation there. Thank you for a very exciting start to this discussion. And following on that, um, if we are to go with you and, and pursue this vision and post-human understanding of ourselves and our world, you've said that what we need is to, it's collective assemblages to redefine what we are capable of becoming. So would you be able to elaborate a bit on what, what that means and what is the necessary makeup of these assemblages, uh, especially how academics or viewers sort of fit into them, uh, and how you think about making these connections between academia and the rest of the world, uh, perhaps drawing on your own substantial experience in, in making those linkages uh, that we might be able to sort of follow in our work as well. Thank you very much. Great question. Uh, assemblage is a horrible term. I wish, it's not the posthuman, it's this terminology that I wish we could re rephrase and, uh, you know, reforge uh, that we need much more creativity here to, to come up with um, a terminology that kind of appeals to people. There's something not very appealing about books that even it begins with post. Uh, a lot of the posthuman sounds like you're inhuman or you don't like the human. It gives a completely the wrong uh, idea and certainly assemblage is counterintuitive. So assemblage is the only possible translation of a wonderful French term which has a very different resonance and the original is agencement. Agencement is the faculty of agency. Faculty of the capacity for the process of agency. Agencement is one thing, assemblage is, is another because you lose the crucial idea, which is agency. We are accustomed in philosophy to attribute agency to one subject, one, him again, the man of reason. What we need to do in the era of, I think we've had this discussion since the 1980s really, it begins with postmodernism, another post that we have to leave behind. Uh, we've been having this conversation for a while. We need to diversify the understanding of the subject, nomadically, pluralistically, uh, through diversity and multiple positioning, multiple politics of location. Accept that the faculty of agency it does not reside in one, but is distributed across a number of elements. And in the work of uh, feminist politics of location, we use intersectionality to, the, to describe the plurality of elements. If you're describing subjectivity, a subject, an agent, whatever you want to call it, you need to take into account embodiment, and a class, and gender, race, age, able-bodiedness, religion, there's a multiplicity of factors I and mean, then you bundle with something that we call the subject, but to reduce the subject to the man of reason is a dramatic reduction and an impoverishment of our understanding of subjectivity and the, the people of the earth, the minority subject of the earth have been complaining about it since the, at least the 1960s, if not before. Um, so uh, assembling a plurality of capacities and competences and calling it the subject is the process of heterogeneous assemblages. It's a, it's a process ontology where agencies is distributed across a number of elements, the, 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 the intersectional one and in the posthuman convergence massively at least two other uh, axes uh, of positioning, the climate change and the advanced technology the earth, the environment, and the machines. And uh, here we are with our screen and our microphones and our laptops, and we're completely mediated. We're next to each other, we may be worlds apart. We could be doing this with you in Toronto, uh, you in Vienna, me in Utrecht. It would be just as good, not as much fun, but it would be just as good. Mediation. We are not one, we are forever elsewhere in timeless time. That's what we are, because this is 2023, not 1632. Uh, so, so welcome to, 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 to the reality of our embodiment, of our positioning, the politics of location in the here and now. And so that's what the heterogeneous assembly stands for. And it's horrible. I wish we could actually have a language that we can finally remove from the, the political economy of humanism 
vision of one subject of oneness, but it's it's a, it's a long way to go, uh, and it's, I think uh, there's not in, enough um, investment academically, scientifically, into researching a language that would do justice to complexity and multiplicity. Transhumanism, invest in humanism. Then you have one subject, grammar does the job that grammar has done for millennia, all is good. Remember Jacques Lacan saying, if you believe in grammar, you believe in God. It's one subject, him, it's always him. Um, so if we stay within that, we solve problems, but we create, create a multitude of other problems that we cannot express the multiplicity or complexity of the way we live, and consequently, we don't provide an adequate theoretical representation of who we have become. Uh, so a Jean Small process ontology of heterogeneous elements that compose something that is a distributed subjectivity. But you see, I need a sentence and a half to make the point. When you say man, everybody knows what I mean, okay? Man, everybody knows, oh, really. And if you start scratching the surface, of course, a thousand questions come up. But the academic world has not accepted that critique, certainly not in Europe. Of humanism, it would still be perceived as either, um, you know, relativistic, unscientific, or even worse, politically correct, um, guilt tripping in the present reactionary and this climate that we're in. So then we assemblage thinking has become very large, and then I conclude in political, social political theory. We have Manuel de Landa writing on assemblages, we have again KK Tales writing on it. There's a, you, if you look up assemblage theory, you will find a whole constituted um, school now. Um, and, and my feminist variation on you know, agencement and, and nomadism is part of that. But I insist we should do research on language itself and coin new terminologies to the credit of the LGBT2 community, particularly of trans feminists, that they are actually intervening massively on grammar. And they say, call me they, call me it, uh, call me something else, and intervene on the language, but it's the only community that is really doing that and is creating enormous upheaval and a huge backlash. But I think that the, the way to go is precisely to say, as a heterogeneous assembly, you can't even say human, and saying post-human is, you know, not great. It's as good as it gets, but it doesn't have to, again, explain what you mean. We need creativity and courage, I think. Can I, uh, can I briefly follow up on that? Uh, I think that questions of concepts and uh, what it means to uh, how if we move towards post-humanist understanding of the world and of post-human understanding of the world what is the risk uh, of bringing with us old concepts um, and ideas that are, that are derived from, from humanism and uh, as Michelle and I are both lawyers in international law and concerned with environmental questions there's a big topic of uh, rights of nature and uh, I was wondering whether there's one story. Do you see a risk if we, for example, apply the language of human rights, of rights to nature, with, which can be understood simply as an extension of human rights? And it's a, 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 a very humanist framework, right? Really, what is the risk of reproducing hierarchies? by using the same concepts and, and, and can, can such a framework, such as the rights of nature framework, ever account for something like a post-humanist, post-human subjectivity or how do we go about that work? Again, a, a great question. Humanism is uh, the foundational stone of our entire system. Um, uh, it, it's, it is the secular branch of monotheism, so it, 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 it's kind of secularized religion. It's the basis of a legal system and our system of values, of ethics, of morals. Um, uh, so it's not something that one shakes off uh, easily or that one should necessarily. Uh, my argument is that it is the very um, uh, effect of our market economy and of our technologies that have eroded the relevance of humanism. Because when the transhumanists say the way to perfect the human is to make it closer to the machines, to enhance it, to make it technologically augmented, they 
would have to work very hard to convince me that this is a statement in favor of the human. It looks, sounds like the opposite to me. And yet they present it as a way of defending, so to speak, um, the human. Humanism is a very difficult um, and complex uh, uh, notion to come to terms with. That's why I would go for a serious discussion about this. Part and parcel of humanism is a tradition of emancipation, a tradition of equality. It starts with the French Revolution giving equal rights to some men, it's only for men, women are not part of the picture, uh, Jews are not part of the picture, people of color are not part of the picture, children are not part of the picture, disabled are not part of the picture. It's some white men, but within that, they get the universal brotherhood, universal human rights. It will take women another couple of centuries to get remotely there, and the rest of the world is still waiting in queue uh, to get their human rights. So it's not surprising that from vast um, sections of the human population, and as international lawyers, you know this perfectly well, this human rights thing is dodgy, and it's really perceived as, as, the, as the, the preaching moral mission of the West that doesn't implement it at home, but then imposes it on the rest of the world. And it's met with enormous um, skepticism um, by dictatorship like China, that, that they don't share our values, uh, but also by certainly on the decolonized and post-colonial people that are skeptical, shall we say, the least. So it's a complicated legacy, and one that would call for a serious assessment, because of course I am indebted to a traditional equality thinking that comes from the, from the Enlightenment and from humanism. Um, uh, it did uh, allow us to think some forms of emancipation, it, it did get us places, and, other cultures have not had this, this commitment to justice, to equality, to brotherhood. Um, a feminist invented sisterhood to match this. Um, and, and in, back in the 60s, it was a way of saying, cuckoo, we're here to remember us uh, and to become included into this model. But I think it would require a much more serious discussion. It has become untouchable as some sort of dogmatic value. And then you touch it, you're on risk and peril. And the university is part of it because the humanities and, uh, and humanism are at the core of our model of higher education and, and uh, uh, consequently difficult to look at. So I, what I would call for is an assessment of the notion in the light of the criticism made by feminists and which people people and communities, um, indigenous, decolonial, postcolonial communities, people of color, people that have suffered from the bellicose humanism, as Edward Said called it, from white man's burden. This idea that we are the missionary culture that has to go out and teach the barbarians how to behave because only we have a sense of universal rights, which is quite preposterous considering our colonial past, our fascist past, and you know, the, the horrors of which we're responsible, as well as all the wonderful, incredible things that our culture has accomplished. So the fact that we cannot have a forum where this discussion can take place is delaying the process. Rapidly, it's to the credit of law and legal theory that you need to have a position on this, and, and I've said it recently, I'm really suffering from law envy, because you have to have a position because you deal with the real world, you have to have something to say about the rights of rivers and the rights of nature. There is a precedent, of course, and that is animal rights in the 1970s with uh, Peter Singer and more recently Martha Nussbaum of Frontiers of Justice and moral philosophy applying the kind of universalism, the moral universalism to everything that lives in a very noble um, and, and just manner, um, but also a little bit sort of a thing around the edges. <laughs> Uh, because it applies uh, humanism uncritically. So what does it mean to give animals the same rights as human at a time when the human themselves are facing a number of limitations in our own evolution, see the competition by technology, but also uh, our own environmental devastation and the possibility of not being able to survive. Is humanizing the non-human others the best way to actually help other entities to survive? Um, or are we giving them a poison gift, to stay with the metaphor of poison, which was also part of my lecture, are we giving them a slice of a poison cake? Say, oh, you can be human too, just as everything kind of falls to pieces. Big question mark. I have difficulties with the imposition of a humanist model that repeats that universalist gesture 
and presents it as altruistic and loving and generous, when it's in fact very appropriate, extremely limited, and it excludes all the criticism made by feminists and uh, decolonial people that are being dismissed as relativistic. Now, between universalism and relativism, there is the thing that matters, situated knowledges, perspectives, the politics of location, the politics of imminence. You're speaking from somewhere specific, embodied and embedded, and the position that you're speaking from is a window of perspective on reality. If you don't believe me, believe Leibniz, that theorized this in nomadology back centuries ago. Believe Spinoza, it was a perspectivist saying everything that lives has knowledge and understanding to different degrees. An earthworm knows a little bit less than a dolphin, but they both know things, uh, let alone the humans. Uh, Spinoza uh, 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 and Nietzsche is another perspectivist. So perspectivism is the philosophical kind of encounter, the field of encounter, where you can also bring in the um, old rights of nature people, and you can bring in non-Western systems, notably indigenous systems, where perspectivism is everything. Everything that lives has knowledge and understanding. In fact, Viviero de Castro argues in his work on perspectivism, everything that lives has a soul. Uh, we differ in the kind of bodies that we have, but we all have a soul, we all have intelligence, we have different bodies, the differential element is the body, and I'm totally in agreement with that as a bodily materialist. Uh, so I think, again, we go to the point that we need to critique the humanist universalism and be very careful uh, that it doesn't become an instrument to capture of the diversity of the living, and it said that, and better to have the right of nature than uh, transhumanism or crass exploitation. Um, and I repeat, we have in the history of European philosophy models of perspectivist materialist philosophies that can be very inspirational at this point for us to rethink the unity of nature and culture, the unities of mind and bodies, and the unity of the human and non-humans. We have those philosophical tools, let us use them. Thank you. Before we have to close, we'd love to take this opportunity to ask your advice um, for the next generation of academics, particularly in terms of how to blend a, a prolific writing career and activism and institution building, as you have done throughout your career. Uh, our generation is starting careers in uh, a world full of neoliberal institutions that prioritize, for example, individualism. So how can we build community and create spaces to think collectively in this context? Um, how can we work in that context while also creating alternatives? Well, what a great question. Um, let me put it this way. It is my greatest hope that your generation, people like you, will never drop out of institutions, will stay in the university and research environment and lead the next wave of um, academic decision makers and, and science leaders, because we need a people of your talent to stay in. Having said that, I am very critical of the neoliberal governance of universities and the way in which it treats uh, starting researchers and the younger generations in general. Um, I think the, the, the complete suspension of the tenure system, I think the hierarchical distinction between different types of professorships, I think the academic star system, coupled with the injustices that are at the, but at the basis, at the bottom of the academic hierarchy, the precariousness, and the, the suspension of all rights and benefits, and the lack of research support, and the tyranny of grant writing and grant seeking, um, the, the self-entrepreneurial understanding of the researchers are devastating mechanisms. And I see the effects on the younger generation daily, the, the, the rate of burnout, the rate of fatigue, the rate, the rate of uh, discomfort, really. Um, we baby boomers lived in a much poorer world. We didn't have any of the technologies. Being poor was fine, having bad haircuts was fine. We didn't have Instagram or any of the visual means of terror that you people, young people, have to live with. Uh, but we were, to a certain extent, left alone, partly because it was okay to be poor. Uh, we didn't have brands, we didn't live in, in the same world of representation. 
so in some ways we need to learn from you and listen to the younger generation very carefully to understand the level of the pressure that you're under. I've seen um, CVs of my 25-year-old um, PhD students that left me astounded with admiration at everything that I had done by the age of 25. I went back because I'm a, a maniacal archivist to read my CV at 25. Yeah, really, obviously. Um, uh, yes, so militating with Simone de Beauvoir in feminist groups in, uh, in Paris. It's not something you can put in your CV, but that's what I did mostly through my PhD years. Yes, I did meet the goddess. It was unbelievable. I will never recover from meeting what I thought was the most extraordinary human being I've ever met. Does that go on your CV? Not really. Did I publish anything? Yeah, articles in Liberation, some scientific research. That was. And I think my generation would have done that. We created the journals in which we published. My main thought was Kate Stimson. Stimson. She invented a journal called Science. Science is the leading feminist journal on Earth. Um, they even have a Kate Stimson Prize now. She invented it, then I published in it. And uh, my publishers is Politic Press. They were created the year that I finished my PhD. Nobody knew who they were. I had written a rather good PhD. They published it. So can you see the difference? In a, to, to our credit, to my credit, we went with history. We radicalized the historical chances that we were given. We didn't play easy. I could have queued up and gone to Cambridge University Press. I said, no, let me take the radical press. So we dared, but the stakes were very different um, and the pressures were others. So today uh, we have to be humble on, at both ends of the spectrum and discuss together what mode of compromise is possible. Uh, I resent it when my generation, first of all, doesn't retire. I think anybody 65 has to retire and stop. Um, and also, we have to understand that we don't have much to teach the younger generation because we live in a different world. We were brave, we were great, we did wonderful things, and I'm not denying the risks that we took. But what you have to put up with is of a different order. So I think we need now new heterogeneous assemblages <laughs> between the older generation of academics and the younger ones in the spirit of the university as an intergenerational transmission apparatus where the older train the younger and transmit to the younger and vice versa between you and us come unbelievable world changing events i belong to the cold war i come before internet just that i remember a world where europe was five nation states end of story i remember going to berlin it was like going to the moon uh, and we went to keep it alive because if the lights go out in Berlin, the lights go out in New York and, and London too. Uh, can you imagine? You can't even begin to imagine this. And internet, please. There was one telephone out in the corridor and the head of the family or the head of your college ran it. And so can you just imagine? So what do we really have to teach you? Endurance, courage, radicalism with excellence. But I think what we need to answer your question is an inter generational dialogues. It is a pity in a sense that academic stardom was invented in the 90s as my generation came of age and some of us became unnecessarily famous. Um, uh, that's not something that should ever happen to anybody. Gertrude Stein said try to become famous very late in life because it takes a lot of time uh, to work Gertrude Stein. Uh, I think academic fame is another layer of pressure that has come over you. Believe me, none of us ever imagined that it is a pretext to make some radical very visible because they become the token alibi figures and the rest of you has to be uh, uh, put through a very demanding and very ungiving set of institutional pressure. So it's not an ideal, it's not a model. And I think I've always worked very hard for any of my privileges and, and put in very long hours uh, because I always felt a little bit guilty at the fact that so much was given to a radical generation. We work for it, we, we dare, I don't want to take anything away from us, <laughs> um, you know, the radical feminists and the radical, the tenured radicals as our enemies call us. Um, but I do think it's not a model. I think the model is to be a, a reinvention of the intergenerational relationship in the mode of solidarity and mutual understanding. You have to explain to us what Instagram is and why I should be on it, I won't be. And we need to explain to you the importance of not having a career 
plan of moving fast and breaking things to quote the boys of Silicon Valley, to dare, to have courage, to have vision, to stick to your guns. But when I see everything that you have to put up with, I go back to the medieval model of the university and I become a pastoral care type of person. And I will say to you, take care of yourselves. Take care. Because the pressures are enormous and I'm not sure that the institutions care enough. But as feminists, as LGBTQ people, professors, as radical, we care. Crucial that you should be well in your mind and your body. And if the institution is not treating you well, there is a market economy out there. Cognitive capitalism will know what to do with you. But I repeat, don't drop out. Drop in. Become the next generation of leaders, please. Thank you so much for that, that perspective and very sound and caring advice. Um, we, could, we wish we could keep talking all day with you, but instead we will just thank you for spending a couple of days with us here at the EUI, um, visiting us as a, to give the Max Weber lecture, to offer a master class, and now to do this interview that luckily we get to share with a wider audience. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much.